uh, we have just a small delay. We we are online now. So, Kate, thank you very much for your presence here today. And I will start a small presentation of you, firstly, in Portuguese. Okay. Um, Ana K. Beresmeyer é geóloga, pesquisadora sênior e curadora de paleontologia de vertebrados no Museu Nacional de História Natural Smithsonian. É reconhecida como pioneira no campo da tafonomia e no estudo dos ecossistemas terrestres no tempo geológico, com especial enfoque em paleoecologia e evolução humana no continente africano. Por meio de experimentos e observações em ambientes recentes e pregressos, ela tem liderado estudos sobre processos que afetam restos orgânicos e podem levar à fossilização, a tafonomia. Ela foi considerada uma das 50 mulheres cientistas mais importantes pela Discover Magazine em 2002, e prêmios recentes incluem a Medalha da Sociedade Paleontológica de 2018 e o Prêmio G GK de 2019, Prêmio Warren Academia Nacional de Ciências. Eu tenho que dizer que você foi uma inspiração desde o início da minha carreira e ter você em nosso evento agora, falando também para muitos dos meus alunos, é uma comprovação do que as mulheres são capazes de fazer na ciência. É um prazer tê-la como nossa palestrante. And then I will make a, a short introduction here. Um, Anna K. Beresmeyer is senior research ge geologist and curator oh great paleontology at the National Museum of Natural History Smithsonian. She's recognized as a pioneer in the field of taphonomy and the study of land ecosystems through geological time, with a particular focus on the paleoecology of human evolution in Africa. Through, through experiments and observations in both modern and ancient environments, she has been a leader in taphonomy, the study of processes that affect Uh, organic remains and lead either to recycling or fossilization. She was one of the Discover Magazine's uh, 50 most important women scientists in 2002. Recent awards include the 2018 Paleontological Society Medal and the 2019 GK Warren Prize from National Academy of Science. I have to say you have been an inspiration since the beginning of my career Having you, having you at our event now, also speaking to many of my students, is a testament to what women are capable of in science. It's a pleasure to have you in our, as our speaker. Thank you, Kay. Nossa, parece que a palestrante caiu. Hello. Hello. Uh, now you are back. I, I, since you have some problem with internet, it's okay now? Yeah, I think it's okay. Um, I just didn't, I was trying to stop my mail from coming in. Ah, don't worry. Don't worry. But it's, okay. it's okay. It's okay. I just uh, finished the presentation, okay. so you can start uh, wherever you want. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Marion. Let me see if I can get my screen to go here. Uh, okay. And... Uh, Duda, uh, eu coloquei no modo de apresentação aqui. Você pode me ajudar? All right. I, I hope everybody can see this. First. I don't know. It's some problem. It's happening some... I don't know what's happening here. It's uh, not sharing. I'm trying to do some adjustments. Is it sharing now? No. No, it's sharing. It's sharing now. It's sharing now. Okay. Okay. Wow. <laughs> So I'm very sorry for the... No, don't worry. Okay, now I'm trying it again. 
Is this okay? It's okay. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank <laughs> you so much, Marion, and, and everyone. Um, I'm very delighted to be here. I very much appreciate being invited to give the second in, in this series of, of talks for your Wonder Paleontology uh, course. Um, of course, it's very hot summer here, so I've had to block out the sun from my own office here at home. Um, and I will uh, go through uh, this talk. There are a lot of ideas in the talk. I usually uh, end up having too many things to say, but I hope I can adhere to the time um, and give you some time at the end for, for questions. So the title, uh, Death, Destruction, Recycling, and Preservation. Uh, this is focused on lessons in taphonomy that I've uh, accumulated and like to communicate from one place on the planet, Amboseli National Park in Kenya. But I think, um, at least I hope I can convince you that these are some generalities that apply across land ecosystems um, on all continents. So it starts with questions about the fossil record. And so, um, of course, the first questions for these fossils found on the ground in Pakistan might be, well, what animals do they represent? We have a uh, horse uh, radius, we have uh, sewage, or pig teeth in a row and some baba teeth. And for many paleontologists, the, the identity of these is critical and that's very important. And Mike Benton in his talk last year focused on what individual fossils can tell us, and they can tell us a huge amount. My interest has been in what the assemblages of fossils can tell us about ancient ecology and also about the processes that select some of these remains to come to us as fossils and um, eliminate or recycle an awful lot of other organism remains that that we'll never see and we have to try to reconstruct. Okay, okay, just a second. Uh, you can, uh, there is a button that you can hide. Yes, okay. thank you. Thank you, I'm sorry. I didn't know if you could see that too. So my questions are uh, many, but here are three of them. How well do the dead represent the ones living? That's in terms of the communities of uh, organisms, not just vertebrates, although that's my focus, but also of course, invertebrates and plants and, and microorganisms as well. What determines destruction versus preservation? And I have destruction in quotes here because I've slowly realized that nothing is really destroyed. It's recycled. The nutrients that are in these remains are, are going back to feed other organisms. So destruction is really not the right way to think about it. And also then, how are taphonomic processes recorded by bone assemblages? These uh, consist of a lot of trace fossils, actually, on bones and around bones or other uh, types of hard parts and even soft parts that tell you something about the processes that preserved uh, or did not preserve the fossils. So, of course, this is the uh, province of taphonomy. This is one of my favorite diagrams. Um, pretty complicated. I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, but um, these lines with the little filters and then the turbulent sort of uh, icon here shows that the, the information is uh, transformed along these arrows. And this one, of course, is a really important one, recycling. A very, very small amount of material actually gets into the buried remains and then comes back to us to, to form our paleobiological samples from which we try to reconstruct the past. And of course, when you think of fossils as a paleontologist, you, you often focus on the geology, the depositional and diagenetic process that occur in this part of the diagram. But in fact, an awful lot is going on in the ecology of the recycling processes before things ever get into the geological system. But starting with the geological side of it, this is a, a, 
an amazing uh, outcrop in Pakistan. There's a figure in a circle uh, down at the lower right for scale or lower central here. And this is a, a diagram of the architecture and cross section of some of these Sawalik sediments and showing in red dots where the fossils occur. And they're uh, about 78% are associated with abandoned channels. Well, what's special about those? They have the right balance apparently of uh, burial rates and slower decomposition rates so that that's where our, a lot of our record has been preserved in Pakistan and this is also true in many other places as well. There are uh, these lines with the hatch marks on them that are the paleosols. These are the ancient land surfaces represented in the photograph in the red and orange layers where the, the animals and plants actually lived but they don't record uh, much in the way of a fossil record at all, partly because that's where the forces of uh, recycling were very good at um, taking the remains and turning them back into nutrients for the living system. So 50% of fossil bone beds uh, in a compilation I did some time ago actually occur in fluvial deposits or river deposits. And um, the others are, are important, um, but I want to focus on the fluvial for, for this talk and what goes into that. And if you think about it with this, this diagram, this model, um, if you have a, a channel and this is a cross section, so the channel is forming uh, deposits and point bars laterally eroding into its floodplain. This is a typical way that channels uh, build up their beds. You can have the carcasses getting in through transport over land or in the, the channel itself. But um, quite a lot of the input to the channel actually comes from erosion of these banks and fossils or pre-fossils that are buried in the, the landscape uh, of the floodplains. And I've done other work on modern rivers that has, has shown how important this is. And so the attritional mortality, that is the, not the mass deaths or the bone bed type places, but the, the places where um, the landscape uh, accumulated uh, fossils, uh, bones, and then that then became fossils or were recycled uh, becomes a, a major thing to try to understand about uh, our vertebrate fossil record. And what this then does, all of these processes go together to create river riverbeds and abandoned channels, as I pointed out before, that have samples of ancient animal communities and sometimes plants as well. So this takes us then to uh, the rationale for studying Ambicelli, which is actually not a fluvial system. It's a, a, a swamp and lake system uh, with a lot of uh, surrounding plains in southern Kenya. But it happened that I was able to collaborate with an ecologist there so I could do a lot of what I originally wanted uh, to do to study this uh, normal or attritional mortality that occurs on land surfaces. So this is what Ambicelli looked like in 1975. Uh, it still had rhinoceros and Kilimanjaro in the background, which is across the border in Tanzania, uh, was magnificent and had uh, snow on it. It's, uh, you know, in 45 or more years since then. Um, that's, many things have changed about this ecosystem. So I started out not knowing if I could um, prolong the study into the future from 1975. I've been very lucky to be able to do that and actually see these changes and record what the bones are telling us about them as well. So for Ambicelli taphonomy, um, I'm going to go through uh, the processes of destruction and preservation, including signatures of these processes. I'll, I'll mention that throughout the talk. Some of you are interested in bone modification. Uh, so I will um, try to 
to give you some examples. Uh, what happens when there is a mass mortality to the bone assemblage? Uh, something about burial and mineralization. And then toward the end, uh, answering the question of how well do the dead actually represent the living? And that is something taphonomous have called the issue of fidelity, how faithful are the fossils or the, the remains of the dead organisms in a particular assemblage to the once living community. So uh, also I'll, I'll get to some of the implications for the fossil record after that. So this is a, an air view in the upper right of uh, Ambicelli. Uh, the swamps are formed by springs that come out from the base of Kilimanjaro, this giant mountain, uh, lots of groundwater. And uh, in the early days of my study, there were um, strips of uh, woodland, pretty dense woodland along the swamps and, and scattered uh, plains and other habitats. In the uh, satellite photograph, you can see the green as the, the swamp areas. And there's a lake bed uh, that's seasonal off to the upper left there. Uh, a variety of habitats, uh, including bushland as well to the north. The um, fauna today of uh, Ambicelli Park is, is much what, of what uh, one would expect in uh, Africa. Uh, the predators are shown here. Uh, when there were a lot of trees, there were leopards. Now the trees have uh, have died back, so it's much more plains and bush, and the leopards are no longer a part of this uh, ecosystem, or at least not, they have not shown up for quite a while. And the herbivores are uh, everything from elephants uh, to uh, hippo and buffalo. Wildebeest and zebra are the most common. And uh, rhinoceros were there um, in the 70s, and they went uh, locally extinct uh, due to poaching pressure and just lack of a viable population in the, in the late 1980s. So we actually were able to record the, the extinction of one of the major herbivores. And then, of course, there are also lots of smaller animals, uh, including uh, owls and ostrich, or one of the, uh, the non-mammals, the dinosaurs that are also inhabit this ecosystem. And that's a whole different story, what the, the uh, small mammals are saying about uh, Ambicelli. The bone surveys um, were done along uh, established transects in 1975. And here you can see the different uh, habitats, usually uh, spaced out about a kilometer apart. Uh, and linear except along the edges of the swamps. We didn't actually go into the swamps, uh, but we're able to sample along the edges of them. So I established these transects early on uh, with uh, Dorothy Deschamps Boas, who was on the right up there, um, looking at a vulture skeleton. And then we kept going back at years after year. So you can see going from uh, 75 at the bottom up to 2019 near the top that these are the uh, months and times when uh, I've done the, the resampling or the, the research visits, some of them very short, uh, but substantial ones um, over some years to uh, resample always in the dry season because uh, July, August, September, and into October are the times when the, the grass and other vegetation is lower, uh, low enough that we can pretty well see the bones on the ground. These are my collaborators, some of them, there have been many over the years. David Western, the ecologist that originally uh, invited me to look at bones in Ambicelli, has also maintained uh, his monitoring of the living populations uh, all this, all these years, and um, we are still uh, working on putting together the live dead comparisons from his extended database. And then various uh, people from the Kenya Wildlife Service, Aristus Kenga, and, and uh, local 
people um, like David Maitumo who have really uh, helped with the field work. And this was our 44th year of surveying some of the transects in July of 2019. And I'm hoping for a 50th year in 2024. Okay, so the data uh, consist of um, the bone surveys. And these are, are, I call them transects, but they're actually uh, plots that are 50, 30 to 50 meters wide and, and uh, varying distances up to over a kilometer in each of these habitats. Uh, carcass watch where there were mark skeletons, uh, also hyena den uh, observations, and then the live survey data uh, for the wild species. And those are restricted to the animals that are large enough to be counted from airplanes generally. So the total sample uh, for the live counts is now well over 200,000 over all these years, and um, now uh, the minimum number of individuals is MNI, um, I'm sure is, is over 4,000 now, because this was this has not been updated uh, with the most recent surveys. So what uh, I discovered in 1975 was uh, and with the help of David Western and his knowledge of the populations. For instance, if you look at the wildebeest and follow the arrows, uh, a stable population of wildebeest of a thousand uh, usually has about 250 deaths and births per year. So that means 250 carcasses, a lot of which are juveniles, which are rapidly uh, scavenged and, and recycled. So then uh, that goes down to 150 carcasses. And then the square in the bottom is, is 50 that actually make it into the burial environment. And these are bones that are not completely buried. We didn't dig up Ambicelli. We just watched uh, and recorded the ones that were uh, more than 50% buried, but less than 100%. So this means that there's 40% rapid recycling. Uh, in these times, and another 40% are, are taken out um, in the slower processes of recycling, ending up with that uh, number of uh, about 20% of the 250 carcasses with some buried remains. Now the circles represent the number of bones, so a lot of those also disappear. So for any of those 50 that end up in the ground, only about eight bones uh, per individual on average at this time were there. And of course those might not be identifiable. So I wanted to say something now about the rapid uh, bone modification and recycling processes. Because the processes are what we're really interested in, what they do and how they might be more generally applicable to the fossil record. So, What's really come out of this uh, study is the, uh, the, the cost, uh, the supply and demand, I should say. That is the balance of predators and macro scavengers versus the prey controls the rate of bone recycling. So if you have, um, you have the Krakuta Krakuta, the bone crunching specialist, which is very good at, at chewing up the bones and you can see the uh, feces on the lower right there when there are few carcasses, when there are lots of hyenas, then very little uh, survives their uh, scavenging. On the other hand, if the meat specialists, the, the cats are um, dominant as predators, then more bones uh, survive. And this is uh, taphonomic evidence of an extreme recycling pressure that you can see in these fragments of uh, wildebeest uh, leg bones, the, the chewing marks, the, the typical kind of spiral fractures, uh, these are often all that, that remain from uh, the hyenas when the population is high. And I just put the one on the right, you can see how huge this giraffe humerus is. It was actually split open by a, a hyena and 
um, that takes some amazingly powerful jaws. And you can see, you know, it was efficiently broken so that the hyena could get the marrow. So the hyena population actually increased in the late 1990s. And that gave us the opportunity to look at uh, the change from uh, earlier years to later years. And there was a 72% decrease in the number of bones per individual between those two times, just showing the, the real impact of this uh, bone consuming predator. However, then in 2009, uh, the balance shifted. There was a major drought uh, and uh, it was very sad for the, the two major herbivores. Uh, they didn't die from thirst, they died from the lack of good forage uh, in the vicinity of water. And uh, the, the devastation to the Ambicelli population was extreme with 96% loss of the wildebeest and 70% of zebra and buffalo and somewhat less impact on, on hippo and elephant. But um, we were able to go and look at the bone assemblage right, right after that in 2010 and therefore uh, check on what a mass mortality and a great surfeit of carcasses uh, could do to the bone assemblage. So this is one of the things that that was very apparent. Uh, low damage levels post drought, not surprising. Uh, in the left, the wildebeest uh, humeri under typical scavenging pressure, there's not a lot left. In 2010, uh, we were finding complete uh, bones all over the the place the hyenas were still there, but they uh, they had so much uh, to eat, just of the the non skeletal material that they really didn't bother breaking the bones. Uh, it's also manifested in this uh, picture from even a zebra jaw was subject to uh, a lot of of chewing. It's a very tough item, but. The hyenas like to, to eat the pulp under the teeth, so they did that in 2002 and four. but in 2010, it was not of particular interest. So it's obvious, I'm sure to everyone, that this kind of change means a lot more potential fossils. And so we can actually quantify it with uh, the carcasses from the mass mortality of just the wildebeest. So uh, 960, that's the 96% mass mortality and then very little scavenging and loss in the uh, next stage down. And then and so only 7% subject to rapid recycling and then the slower recycling still means that a, a lot of uh, bones are going to, and individuals are going to get into the the potential record. So this also shows up uh, in terms of the bones per individual of just the two most abundant species. And this is a uh, low weathering stage, which I'll show, talk about in a few minutes, but um, these are the more recently dead and uh, you can see the change in both of these common animals due to the, the hyena uh, effect. And that's in 2002, 2004, when there were a lot of hyenas and fewer carcasses. In 1975, it was actually a, a post drop, but also a time when there were few hyenas in, in Ambicelli. So if I had just stopped my study uh, in the 70s, I would have had a totally different view of uh, the potential fossil record from this ecosystem. The long-term uh, research has been really critical to show these changes. Okay, now we'll move into thinking and, and talking a little bit about the more uh, slow processes of bone recycling. Weathering has been a, a major uh, 
topic for my research in Ambicelli and started with marking carcasses uh, with little drill holes actually and, and photographs because we had no GPS in 1975. And then collecting a part after each visit and um, knowing the date of death for a, a good subset of this. And this is just one example of a sequence of, of mandibles from a, a lion killed wildebeest that we happened upon the the morning after it died and then followed all the way through uh, until there were no more remains, but that was long after 1982. This is a, a cow that died in 1973 in a, a, a slight uh, depression, a channel uh, in the bush area and it actually uh, got partly buried there. So we dug it up in 1985 and you can see the sequence um, 1976 through 1982 with the ribs. And then by 1985 on the surface, there was almost nothing left except fragments, but it even buried a few centimeters down. The bones were extremely good condition showing the importance of rapid burial. So the bone weathering stages uh, now uh, can be calibrated in terms of how long they represent. Uh, so you can see this the weathering stages and the time in, in red. Uh, I've gone on uh, to add a lot, of, a lot more new data to this, but the, this generally is holding up for Ambicelli um, and it's a kind of taphonomic clock. However, uh, the caveat, the, the warning is that this can vary greatly depending on whether the bones are fully exposed to the sun and the elements or um, they are shaded and protected under vegetation. So this is one skeleton that has weathering stages all the way from buried uh, weathering stage zero uh, and shade to full sun exposure. So um, this means that one needs to be cautious uh, and probably focus only on the most weathered elements of any particular skeleton. And I just wanted to give one example of, yes, these bones, uh, the features of weathering can be preserved in the fossil record. They can be hard to interpret, but this is an example from the Pleistocene, uh, a lower metapodial compared with the weathering stage three modern one uh, above it. The best, uh, evidence for weathering uh, pre-burial is to have the matrix actually in the cracks so you know that it uh, occurred then. And even then it can be problematic. So applying this to the fossil record is, is not always easy. Uh, the taphonomic clock issue, you can see the, the error bars now going from years on the x-axis and the weathering stage. So up to weathering stage two, it's uh, pretty good, although there is overlap. But then the arrows in black show that the uh, length of time can be greatly extended for the later weathering stages. But this does allow, uh, allow us to take the different weathering stages and kind of generally divide up the bone assemblage into earlier and later uh, periods of mortality. Uh, usually separating between these uh, first three weathering stages and the last three. And uh, it becomes useful in looking at the uh, distribution of uh, weathering stages for the large mammal herbivores. Uh, this one compares what's normal for weathering stage distributions in 2002, 2004 sample versus after the mass mortality, where of course there's a big spike in the early weathering stages uh, that came in because of the, uh, all the mortality and, and the animals that were mummified actually, and that slowed down the weathering as well. So I wanted to just point out termite damage. Uh, long ago, uh, termites were not thought to eat bone, but they do. They at least get it out of the way or they use the minerals for their termite mounds. And uh, 
I had trouble convincing people of this, but we actually found termites. Uh, and this is an elephant, uh, part of an elephant pelvis. When we turned it over, the, the termite was was hard at work chewing into the bone. So uh, they definitely make these kinds of traces now, and uh, I'm sure they have done so in the past. Also, uh, bacterial and, and fungal damage to the interior of the bones um, is something that I haven't really studied in detail, but it definitely uh, occurs and uh, would affect what might survive into the fossil record. So I want to say a little bit about that, uh, burial and mineralization in Ambicelli. Uh, processes include the uh, transgression of these shallow pans and, and uh, ponds. And uh, these come and go, but they do uh, help to bury remains and also wind and dust does. But trampling is by far the most important along the swamp margins and wherever there's uh, soft soil. Of course, this also uh, destroys or breaks the bones, but it's a, a major process that I, I didn't appreciate before doing this study. This was a baboon uh, that was a known uh, study animal of the baboon researchers in Ambicelli, and they knew when she had died. They knew where uh, her, uh, they didn't actually know where her carcass was, but we found it and were able to identify it uh, buried uh, in one of the woodland areas under the shallow soil and uh, vegetable debris. So um, this is a, a very interesting specimen with, um, and in one year that's what, what had happened to it. And some of these remains could very well uh, have gone on to become fossilized if we hadn't recovered them. And in the uh, aftermath of the drought in 2010, we often would just uh, find the carcasses by the growth of vegetation because of the fertilization that the, the bodies, the decomposing bodies provided. And so this is an example of that. And when there's a lot of vegetation that helps to bury the bones uh, as well and protect them from uh, trampling. And sometimes uh, dust can accumulate and help to bury them that way too. Now, one of the remarkable things that uh, has uh, as one example, and I think there would be more, is that there's some mineralization that occurs very soon after the death of the animal in certain circumstances in, in Ambicelli. I picked up this uh, wildebeest toe bone, uh, which is sectioned on the right, and it's uncracked, it's unweathered. It felt a little strangely heavy when I picked it up in 1975. So I brought it back and thin sectioned it and it actually had calcium carbonate beginning to fill in the pore spaces of the bone. And this, this is not a, a bone that was ever buried, but it was in a, a pan uh, of water. And that is a, a pond, a seasonal pond that uh, when it dried up, the minerals precipitated uh, in, in this bone even before it was uh, had a chance to be weathered. So rapid mineralization is another story that is pretty exciting to follow up on, although I haven't had time to do that. So now I'd like to talk about uh, the, the issue of uh, live dead fidelity. How well do the bones and the bone assemblage represent the living populations in Ambicelli? So there are two components of this that I'll talk about, uh, the abundance comparisons and the species richness. So we're, we're comparing our samples from the bone surveys to uh, mainly what has been recorded by uh, regular air surveys every few months for many, many years in, in Ambicelli. And uh, amazingly, uh, this graph shows a, a very close correspondence with some interesting variations. So for the 15 species uh, larger than 15 kilos, uh, the abbreviations go everywhere from RH for rhino over there on the left and to ZB is for zebra and wildebeest. WB. But there's some animals on, on one side of the line and some on the other. The larger ones 
uh, are on the the uh, more in the dead assemblage and the smaller animals generally on uh, below the line and OS is ostrich, which is the one dinosaur represented here, but it's also of course a bird with light light bones. We don't we do find them, but they, we don't find a lot of them. So you can make some sense of this, um, but it generally implies that if you do equivalent sampling um, and you compare the, the minimum numbers of individuals, the abundances of them, you get uh, the bone assemblage being quite faithful to the living populations. Now, another uh, thing that that we got is a total count of, of the species uh, and the uh, 87 uh, species are known from uh, Ambicelli living and we have picked up 45 of them, but also we've recorded some that were not known from the, the live censusing. And then you can see the birds, the reptiles, amphibians and fish, um, and then the numbers of individuals down below. And for the uh, 44 resampled bone transects in the 70s versus the 2000s, this shows the uh, rarefaction curve basically of the number of species per number of individuals. And you can see the change in the uh, diversity curve basically, or the rich species richness from the 70s to the 2000s. And this goes along with what uh, the people studying the living populations have seen with the, the loss of the trees and the loss of the three-dimensional habitat in this ecosystem, uh, there has been an, an overall decline in the community species richness. Okay, so uh, the recycling rate then, looking at the uh, numbers of bones that we found that were going uh, into the burial environment versus uh, all the ones that were on the way to uh, being recycled, it's actually about 4% making it into the uh, early burial environment out of 96% that are, are recycled back to the biosphere. So that's a, that's a pretty small sample and it makes it even more remarkable that our abundances are, uh, are probably uh, pretty faithful, but what about the buried abundances? In fact, uh, they also are uh, amazingly uh, concordant. And even though it's a, a tiny sample, 227 versus the live on the y-axis, uh, there's still very uh, good relative abundance concordance of these major species. And it's only, uh, like less than a percent of the sample of the living population. So this gives a lot of confidence that if we can do good sampling in the fossil record, we can actually reconstruct relative abundances of the um, original populations. And the guild structure, uh, browser versus mixed uh, versus grazer is also very accurately uh, represented in the live dead and buried, you can see on this histogram, even with the differences in the sample sizes. Okay, so uh, now we're just uh, wrapping up Ambicelli, and then I wanna say a little bit more about larger implications. Uh, there is high live dead fidelity, that's good news for uh, reconstructing past communities. And in the Ambicelli system, early bone recycling is controlled by the hyenas and the cost, uh, well, the benefits of, of oversupply uh, or the balance between uh, supply and demand and the populations of hyenas versus the populations of herbivores and how many are dying. And the weathering and burial rates control later bone survival and then the potential fossil record amounts to uh, three to five percent of the bone assemblage. And as I've emphasized, the mass mortality increases the numbers 
and completeness um, of the bones that escape early postmortem recycling. So implications for the fossil record. Some of you who are experts in the Mesozoic may be wondering what, how this would apply. Um, well, uh, we didn't have bone chewers in the Mesozoic, but we had been bone swallowers. We had different kinds of predators um, and probably different kinds of uh, bone consumption that would also have affected uh, what we find of the original communities. That uh, has yet to be modeled and uh, explored in any great detail. Now, paleontology and ecology, as I've hinted all the way through, um, have a, a very interesting relationship uh, because of recycling. Uh, they're really two sides of the same coin. We study, paleontologists study what didn't get recycled in the original ecosystem. And we all know that life is designed to feed on itself to convert the living and the dead back into the livings uh, as this uh, typical kind of food uh, web and energy pyramid shows. So the, then the question is, you know, this early recycling uh, that Ambicelli represents, how does that really affect the uh, fossil record? And if there's efficient ecological recycling, there won't be any fossils. So it underlines the fact that if, uh, if you have fossils, they, for various and many, many different reasons, need to uh, survive or avoid being recycled. So you can kind of uh, put this together uh, with more uh, general principles and if you could think about it as high productivity, high biological productivity, lower nutrient availability, calcium and phosphorus, environmental uh, stability, burial probability low, like in tropical rainforests, uh, very few fossils, if any, only particular circumstances, maybe like cave deposits. However, if you have uh, low productivity, high nutrient availability, unstable environments, then the burial probability is higher and more likely to have fossils. So you can think of this on a continental scale, and I'm showing Africa here, uh, where there's the high productivity of the tropical band here, uh, the green, there will be high recycling pressure for bone minerals, lower recycling pressure. Um, Ambicelli is just uh, sort of up on the I don't know if you can see this, but where my cursor is, right on the boundary of this, uh, between these two major TAFO zones. And if you think about where mammal species diversity is highest today in Africa, the diversity hotspots are highlighted here in black, and you see the equator, and that's pretty much right where there um, is going to be the maximum recycling. And if you look at the distribution of uh, the mammalian fossil record uh, from the paleobiology database and the fossil localities, um, and you can see where they're concentrated, of course, along the Rift Valley, but very few in the um, high productivity areas. And then you can actually superimpose one on the other and see how the the overall sampling of the communities of, of Africa through the Cenozoic are going to be uh, selective for the, the drier, uh, more uh, preservation uh, likely places uh, for fossils. So this, this isn't necessarily good or bad depending on your question, but we need to remember that vast areas of our uh, continents where there is this rapid recycling are going to be very much underrepresented in, in the fossil record. And of course, this also applies to South America, as you well know. And I have a, uh, just one quick diagram that I put together a while ago, of the distribution of fossil localities. And of course, uh, there are some in, in the tropical areas uh, with the high productivity, but um, I think we we can do more with understanding what we're missing 
as well as uh, expanding from what we have by understanding the, the importance of the, the natural recycling and controlling the fossil record. And of course, uh, you can think of this uh, in a historical framework with Darwin's famous quote um, about the imperfections of the geological record. But I've come to realize that actually um, you, can, you can look at this and think, well, he was implying that each page and the few lines might be uh, a very, very small sample, which we know, but I think they actually could have a, a system to them. That is that we can understand a lot more about what the few lines and the pages represent in terms of, of ecological uh, recycling and uh, what escaped the recycling processes. And um, that will end, that ends my talk. I appreciate your attention. It's been a little strange to give the talk and not be able to see anybody, but I hope I can now uh, uh, return the screen and uh, get to uh, answer questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kay. Um, I'm asking here for, yes, okay, now it's fine. So uh, I believe we have time for some questions. And uh, uh, here, uh, the first one that we have, uh, we have the now the, the pleasure here to receive the president of the Brazilian Society of Paleontology, uh, Dr. Emilio, Emilio Jaraujo. And uh, he's asking, have you observed the incorporation, direct or indirect, of taphonomic features into the thanatocenosis of Ambozelli Park as a result of climate change triggered by human actions? Oh, that's, that's a great question. And in fact, all the way through, uh, David Western, the ecologist, has emphasized the importance of human impact on this ecosystem. Uh, cattle uh, are and have been part of the, of the Ambozelli ecosystem for some time. And they're not supposed to come into the major park, but they have to for water. So in fact, um, human impact has been ongoing uh, all throughout our study. And now I'm hoping to go back to document even more of it because the, uh, the land around uh, Ambicelli, which was uh, accessible to the wildlife is being carved up into uh, ranches and farms with fences. So there, there's a very major uh, potential impact on, on the wildlife. Um, it's not a very big area and they need to be able to disperse into the surrounding uh, region in order to survive. And so um, that's a big concern. But the temperature has also been recorded as, as increasing over the, the 40 some years and I think that has accelerated the rate of weathering. So we can actually test that, but uh, I haven't gotten to it as yet. So um, we're very aware of, of the interaction in this ecosystem of, of humans and wildlife. It's, a, it's an ongoing goal to characterize this also in the taphonomy. Okay, uh, thank you, Kay. Um, uh, we have the f uh, time for the next question. Uh, I believe uh, do that this question was already uh, complete. Uh, but the next one that we have is from, from Gabriel here. Um, Gabriel Ozes said, thanks for the interesting talk, Dr. K. Was it possible to identify weathering parameters, factors, that have influenced later mineralization after burial? We uh, have that goal in mind um, for the buried samples. I have, I have samples of those. Um, we've been looking at changes in proteins. We've been looking at changes in the, the mineralization. There have been a few uh, 
papers published. Um, but the after burial uh, environment is not very accessible for us um, in Amboseli. We, we could only dig up the, the bones that were in very shallow burial situations. There are fossils uh, from the late Pleistocene in Amboseli as well. And uh, those can be studied in terms of the longer term mineralization. Um, there's a lot more to do. And I, um, I can't really uh, say any more than that right now, except that I have samples that people are, are interested in. And let me just also mention um, in respect to the last question I remembered, you know, we can detect on our bones the, the marks of uh, people who have come in as poachers and taken the wildlife because they use pangas, they use the, these machetes. And so sometimes we would find carcasses or pieces of bone even of giraffe and other animals that had clearly been uh, uh, taken in the park by, by humans. Um, maybe they found the carcass dead or maybe they uh, actually killed the animals. So this is something that the Kenya Wildlife Service is very uh, interested in. And uh, I have Kenyan colleagues who have are using taphonomic features and bone modification features as part of their monitoring program for wildlife in, in Kenya. I'm, I'm very happy that they have seen the value of that and uh, uh, we're trying to promote more of it. Um, thank you, Kay. Um, I, I have one question. It's about the, the uh, uh, you mentioned the difference of weathering among um, bones that are under shadow and sunlight, isn't mm -hmm. it? Um, it? There's a small possibility of uh, maybe um, microorganisms like cyanobacteria or fungus or even uh, another kind of microorganisms interacting with the um, neurological uh, or organic parts of the bones? Yes, and that we have found uh, networks of uh, mycorrhizae around some of the bones under the trees and in the shadow and the more protected areas. Uh, and uh, that is a whole area of study that I, I really wish I could uh, pursue or, or help someone else pursue because there will be signatures in the bones that are of the same carcass, potentially uh, the ones that are in the sun, which is physical breakdown. I think the collagen is being broken down by UV light and just the heat and, and cool and changes in the environment that it's pretty extreme sometimes on, this, on the ground surface versus the, the more moist environment in the shade where different processes are at work. So potentially you could even see that if you did micro studies and geochemical studies, and then potentially see it as well in, in a well-preserved carcass of a, of a fossil that might've been under partly under a tree or partly protected. Yes, I believe it's of great interest because of the uh, how maybe this kind of diagenesis, I don't know, but the weathering uh, can affect uh, things like um, breakage or uh, make bone more frail to some, some mechanical issues. Very interesting noting that. Yes, and also the, the weathering, when it goes into stage two or three, the bone becomes very porous. And so it, it tends to, to, if it's on the surface, it absorbs moisture uh, from the surface when it's, especially if the sun is there, it, the moisture comes up through the bone. So we find bones that have salt uh, precipitated and helping to split the bone apart because of this wicking, it's called a wicking action of the porous um, weathered bone. So it, it just accelerates the uh, disintegration. 
Okay. Uh, I, I, I believe um, Professor K has a meeting uh, in a few minutes. Uh, I believe we have time for just the last question, maybe. We, we, I, I'm seeing here the, all the comments and the, we have, you are receiving a lot of compliments <laughs> about you. your, your talk. Um, uh, great talk. Thank you for your talk. Everybody is very exciting about your presence here today. Uh, we have another, um, another question here. Uh, Professor Arminio asks, we have particular type of quaternary deposits here in Brazil, uh, tanks and caves. Mm -hmm. How can we better explore the phenomic aspect of deposits with such unique particularities? <laughs> oh, that, that's a good question. I'm aware of the tanks. Um, I have reviewed a few papers. I, I very much admire the, the efforts and the, the work on these. They, the longer I am uh, in this field of research, the more I realize that, that we've not seen the end of unique taphonomic circumstances that um, help to preserve things and, and work to slow the recycling processes. And I, I, from my understanding, the, the tanks uh, you know, are, are places where bones accumulate, where there uh, maybe were anoxic conditions or some kind of conditions chemically that would um, slow the activities of the, the micro uh, processes that, that would recycle the, the bones and destroy them, but instead uh, help to preserve them. And all I can say is that I don't know of, of any place else that has uh, similar taphonomic, uh, combination of taphonomic processes. So uh, I, would, I would hope that, uh, maybe with more publication of these, there would be uh, understanding and looking for them, maybe uh, places like Australia or even Africa, where you have a shield, you have uh, different kinds of geological substrates that would be conducive to those kinds of processes. And then the caves as well are just are fascinating. There's so many different kinds of karst and cave deposits and I, I'm working on some unusual ones now in in Africa where it's actually a fissure system and a volcanic uh, uh, like a, a disrupted uh, pile of volcanic pumice that created fissures that trap bones and I I'm not even beginning to understand all, all of the how that happens so um, if if you feel like um, you know, you're you're doing some pioneering work in taphonomy. Uh, maybe you you wonder whether anyone else has known about this. Uh, I think you're you're pretty sure that it's a unique situation, and you just need to understand it as best you can with the principles that are out there, um, and uh, put it out for other people to to ponder and and think about and compare with the the other other means of bone accumulation. It's, it's just, there's so much more to do with taphonomy and there, there really isn't any book at this point or a compendium of, it's just like, we're still in the, in the growth curve of the field in understanding all the different ways that bones and other organic materials can be preserved. Well, uh, thank you, Anna. And then f just uh, finishing here, I ask you, uh, you are also an experimental paleontologist. And uh, I, I, I feel that sometimes when we work with experimentation, the other paleontologists just, oh, experimentation didn't work. <laughs> uh, uh, how the experiments, in your view, how the experiments can help to um test conflictant hypothesis in your observation paleontology how, how uh, what the the rule of experimentation in paleontology now um i had a mentor a long time ago who said if you don't understand something and this is process figure out how to measure it and the way to measure things is to manipulate them that is 
in this case, put bones in rivers, see how far they go and what happens to them. So that was a, a pure experimental setup. And by doing that, I was able to understand so much about how bones uh, are affected by river systems in, in the past. So you, you, you figure out ways to measure, and yes, paleontology needs to focus on, on the, uh, the preserved and the, the fossils that are already there. But if we're going to understand the processes that put them into the record and affected them, then the only way we can do that is to study modern, things in the modern through experimentation or observation. Observation and experimentation are what I'm doing in Amboseli, but um, long ago, I just dropped uh, modern bones into a tank of water to see what their, uh, how fast they would settle. And that was very informative as well. And no one had apparently done that before. So, <laughs> you know, simple things can actually tell you a lot and they don't need to be terribly time consuming either. It's just taking that idea and going for a, for the answer to a, a question, and then that leads you to more. Okay, uh, Kate, thank you very much. Just for recording, I'm I leaving some words here, writing here, uh, of how inspiring you are for for me and for other researchers here in Brazil, especially young women that start beginning in science. Um, thank you very much. I know that you have a little time <laughs> and thank you for share your time with us. What's very uh, a great time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And, and it's been my pleasure. And please, uh, you know, share your publications and I will try to send some more your way too. Um, I really appreciate the, uh, the popularity of taphonomy in the in your country and, and other countries uh, on the continent of South America. I would like to come there more in person in the future. Oh, it will be a great time. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.